The Zulus, some of the toughest opponents ever faced by the British Army. During the Anglo-Zulu War, they fought bravely in their regiments, the Amabuto, for their king, Etswaya. But did you know that Etswaya was the nephew of the famous Shaka? Yes, Shaka Zulu from the TV show. Shaka was the man who had founded the Zulu kingdom in the early 19th century, raising it from obscurity to be one of the most powerful empires Africa had ever seen. He was a fascinating and complex man, and there's not a lot of first-hand accounts of him. So to find out more, I'm joined on today's show by Professor John Laband, an expert on the man and on the period and on the Zulu kings. He's written this book about them. Shaka was descended of one of the minor dynasties, minor chiefdoms in the region. And this is a time of competing power play between major paramountcies, the Ndwandwe, the Ntetwa and others. And in the process, um, the Zulu dynasty, if you like, came out on top. The others were eventually defeated or destroyed each other. And then it was a question of consolidating Zulu rule over this whole region between the Pongola River to the north and, the, and south of the Tugela, the, 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 other, the other way. But it's a question in the process of consolidation. Some chieftains didn't want to be ruled, were on the move and, and, and basically upstick because that's the whole nature of Zulu chieftains. It's control of people and cattle rather than a, spe a specific territory so that you are growing in power when you incorporate people under your rule. And if you don't want to be under somebody's rule, you literally move off with your cattle and find somewhere else to live. And what are the main sources we have about Shaka and about uh -huh. you know his his rise to power? Yeah. Is is there much for you to work from? There's not really. They're they're, they're contemporaries, um, Port Natal traders, um, Finn and Isaacs and others, um, John Ross, the young boy who was shipwrecked there. Um, they all have something to say. Um, we have the Zulu testimony which collected by James Stewart at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, which perhaps is the best Zulu sources we have of um, people who were perhaps children at that time or his parents, um, you know, were sort of first generation during that period because the Zulu monarchy as such was very short. I mean, if you've got Shaka basically coming to power in 1816, by 1879, the kingdom was over. So literally then one generation, if you're long lived, you saw the beginning and you saw the end of the kingdom. Shaka is now very fondly remembered in South Africa. There's an airport in Durban named after him. Bizarrely, there's an aquatic park named after him. And there's kids at my son's school called Shaka. But was he a good guy? Well, it depends whose side you're on. If you look at the James Stewart archive, if you're part of the, if you like, ruling Zulu chiefdom and the elite, you think he's the greatest thing since whatever, and, and still today is a founder of the nation and absolutely beloved by Zulu people. But if you're at the wrong end of it, if you are those people who were defeated or moved out or incorporated against their will, um, you get a lot of very adverse testimony about, about Shaka. So you either love him or hate him. Um, that's really how, how it actually goes. And what he actually looked like, we don't really know, long or short, tall or thin, dark or light, the evidence is all, is all different. Um, whether he had a protruding forehead, whether he had buck teeth, whether he lisped, um, all of these things are, you know, really up, up in the air. We don't really know. So, he's, so where we have images for Dingana or Mpande or the other Zulu kings, we don't have an authentic one for, for Shaga at all. So we just have the, if you like, the heroic images which you'll see in Shaga Lembe or you'll see in Shaga Zulu or all these films, you know, huge muscles and looking very handsome, but the real guy, who really knows. We just don't know. We don't know. <laughs> in 1828, Shaka was assassinated by his half-brothers. But what had he done to change the hierarchy of the Zulu people and make the king so powerful? It's all about the Amabuto, the circumcision age groups, which every chief had his own one young men who served the chief and young women who were also in age groups which ma who married the, the, the male Amabuto. But what Shaka did, he got rid of the intermediate layer of chiefs, rather like, if you like, a medieval king getting rid of the nobility and all the feudatories owned, owed their allegiance directly to him and not through an intermediary chief. So, so that's how the Zulu kings managed it. The, the man power and the woman power of the nation through the 
Amobuto system served the king and the king primarily. They were his soldiers, his workmen, his policemen. Um, that's how he did it and that, that, that's how he exercised power. And that's why when the British were so determined in 1879 to destroy the military system because they did understand that this is how the king actually harnessed all the work potential of, of all his subjects. And am I right in thinking as well that just because the king wanted to do something didn't make it so? The chiefs, you know, could disagree with yeah. him. There was these power plays, different factions. Oh, absolutely. And there it depends on the personality of the king, that the king always ruled in council. Um, you'd have his small council and his larger council and certain bigger issues would then be put to the whole nation, so to speak, in a huge endaba, huge meeting. But in reality, if a king was really powerful, nobody's going to argue with him. If Shaka said, I want it this way, or Dingan said, said, I want it that way, there's going to be no argument about this. Um, you know, and they did have the power of life and death, which is the hugely important thing. So every now and again, if you're a Shaka or Dingan especially, if a chief was too powerful, you'd destroy him. He and his people and confiscate all his cattle just to show who was boss and don't argue with me I am really the guy, um, you know. Um, it is perhaps more complex, and this moves into another topic, when you actually decide who's going to be king, because there, the, there were assemblies who would agree who the next, next king was going to be, and there there'd be power play, there'd be various contenders, and there, not the king himself, but the, the power makers would actually decide who the next king was going to be and, and take it from there. With Shaka dead, Dingaan claimed the throne. But a few years later, he was ousted and replaced by his brother Mpande. Succession in Zululand has always been a complicated business, and it still is right up until today. Technically, the way um, succession works in a traditional Zulu, chiefly homestead, is that the chief son of the chief wife, who's not necessarily your first, second, might be third or fourth wife, doesn't matter, the one who is the chief is wife. Is this what they call the paramount wife or the something? The paramount wife, yeah. yeah. She, she would be the one um, whose son would be the technically the heir but it didn't necessarily work like that in practice. Um, Shaga killed his brother Sigurjana. Um, H.Y. in the Civil War of 1856 killed his brother. He killed his brother in, 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 the, in, so Biazi, Biazi, yeah. in Biazi, in that particular one. Um, Dingan, of course, killed Shaga when he took the throne. Um, and Pande didn't actually kill, kill Dingani, but he overthrew him in a civil war. Um, but then when you get to the successors, in fact, um, when you get someone like King Solomon, Dinazulu's son, I mean, there is a question of other brothers who were potential, potentially going to be in line. Um, the same with, with Cyprian who followed. Again, there were other brothers who could be. Um, and when you come to the present king, um, Mrs. Zulu, um, there it is the descendants of his father's chief, no, not chief wife, his first wife, in fact, who was married in a civil ceremony, as opposed to his Swazi princess, who was married in a traditional ceremony. And Mrs. Zulu is descended from the Swazi princess. And Buta, Chief Butale, Prince Butalezi, was very involved in making sure he got it. But the descendants of the first wife from the civil ceremony, they think he should be king. And this has gone on and on. It's been questionable of the Supreme Court. It's gone, and it still is actually continuing. And now, in fact, Mrs. Zulu, who has been courted by the ANC, is rather spitting, so to speak, on Butalezi and trying to break away from it. So, so all of this has always been very complicated. It's been power play, and it's been really who sort of makes it, who gathers the most support, they win. And the question of the chief son or the chief wife Maybe, maybe not, you know. As you can imagine, when Britain defeated the Zulus in the Zulu War of 1879, there was huge disruption in Zululand. What did this mean for the king and for the royal family? Well, one of the objectives in the Anglo-Zulu War of the British was finally to destroy the power of the monarchy. So the king is taken off to Cape Town um, and the royal family loses all authority. When the kingdom's broken up into 13 sections, not one of the royal family is appointed one of the 13 chiefs. So this, you're breaking the power of the royal family. Then in 1882-83, after a lot of 
politic politicking in England and elsewhere, H.Y. has returned to part of his kingdom. The problem for him, though, of course, some of these major chiefs, like Hamu or Zubebu, are in power. They don't want him back. And this Hamu, of course, had gone over to the British. Br British he? during the war. And, and when I say, yeah, he, yeah, so, he, so, he, so he's certainly there maintaining his position. And Zubebu is actually periphery of the royal house as well, up in the north. He's also maintaining his position. So when the king comes back, civil war breaks out. They defeat him. The king flees to the southern third of Zululand, the reserve territory, which the British are controlling. And there he dies. And there his son Dinazulu is left. And he reasserts his power in the civil war by making a pact with the Boers of the Transvaal, who aid him in the civil war, which he wins, defeats Zubebu, but then gives away a third of his kingdom to the Boers of the New Republic as a reward for it. So then you have a very weak Dinazulu left, and then the British in 1887, mainly because they're fearing German interference in St. Lucia Bay and all the rest of it, decide they'll take over the rump of Zululand as a colony in 1887. So the Zulu king, um, Dinazulu, becomes, well, yet another chief in British Zululand and rebels in 1888 and is defeated and is exiled to St. Helena. And, you know, that is the situation of the monarchy. When you come to the late colonial period, the Union of South Africa and the early apartheid era, the king is just another chief, no special authority of the royal house. Um, it doesn't really exist as far as the, if you like, white authorities are concerned. After World War II in South Africa, they brought in a system known as apartheid, which amongst other things involved very strict racial segregation. They also introduced something called Bantu stands, which were sort of semi-independent, self-ruling black enclaves within the country. How did this affect the royal family of Zululand? Yeah, it, it's interesting. It's, it's really during the period of apartheid, when you're looking towards self-governing territories and all the rest of it, when you're looking to in many ways, um, appease African opinion to set up these independent states. So there is a movement to recognize the Zulu king as a paramount chief. Um, that's great, paramount chief with no real power at all, of course. Um, and when you get to somebody like, like King Cyprian, I mean, you have the, the real problem that you're dealing with the apartheid authorities who are giving you a certain amount of authority, they're trying to set up the KwaZulu homeland and all the rest of it. On the other hand, you've got the new um, independence movements, um, the ANC in exile, the UDF at home, who are obviously totally against this kind of collaboration. So you have the Zulu king very gingerly trying to navigate a path between liberation movements and the apartheid government, giving the monarchy some degree of, you know, of, of a new life. And in fact, what really makes all the difference, not much known, in 1989, there was a um, deputation from Contra Lisa, which is this group of traditional chiefs who set up a kind of organization. And they went off to the ANC in exile in Lusaka in Angola. And they dealt with the ANC, who being obviously a Marxist movement, had no truck with kings and all the rest of it, but they made a deal because they realized traditional chiefs had such power over people, especially in the rural areas, as they're called in South Africa. So they made a deal and said, OK, we'll accept the idea of traditional rulers. So that is when you get to 1994 and the negotiations for the new democratic South Africa. The idea of kings and traditional rulers and traditional chiefs are actually written into the negotiations, despite everything you might think. So the deals are made and gets written into the new constitution. And today there have been various changes over the years, but today there are eight traditional kings in South Africa and a whole swathe of lesser chiefs and a house of traditional rulers and all the rest of it. So all of that coexists with really an, an avowedly sort of Marxist um, a and C. So it's, it's a rather odd situation, but, but that, that's how it works. Yeah. The current king, Misuzulu Simhobile Kwaswelitini, took over the throne at the death of his father, King Zwelitini, in 2021. Even that transition has been very difficult. There's been legal battles, there's been alleged assassination attempts. It's not been an easy transition from one king to the other. 
Now, the state of the modern Zulu royal family is outside the scope of this channel, but I hope that's been a good introduction to you for how that family has developed over the last few centuries. Comment below, let me know what you found interesting, and let me know what you've come across from your own research that you think we could add for future videos. Maybe you think I should do a video specifically about Shaka, or specifically about King, it's wild. All those are options, so let me know. All right guys, I'll be getting back to my Indian Mutiny series soon, so do subscribe and hit that notification bell. As the Zulus would say, Hambagatli, go well.